Now today we're going to continue on in our series, our series that's leading us up into our big Easter Sunday. The series is called Jesus Trending, and we've been talking about how Jesus uh, had some conversations while he was in the world, and uh, there were certain people that he had conversations with. So through this series, we saw on, on lesson one that he had a conversation with a guy by the name of Peter, and through Peter's life, we learned about how to have active faith, a faith that actually moves us. We then saw last week that Jesus had a conversation with a guy by the name of Matthew, who Matthew was a tax collector became one of Jesus' followers, and this is a guy that, um, that had a horrible life, made some bad choices, went in the wrong direction, and he was at a point where he was at the lowest moment of his life, and in that moment, we saw that Jesus was the, uh, was the God of the second chance, that he gives every single one of us a second chance, that if you're going through a tough time, if you're going through a moment in your life where you're thinking, look, I don't know if God can fix this, I promise you this, you're not too broken for God. God is into restoration. So we saw, we saw last week that God is the God of the second chance. Now this week, we're going to look at the life and a conversation that Jesus has with, um, with Martha and Mary about their brother named Lazarus. Now the message uh, for today is called God's timing. Now we're going to talk about you, you know, waiting for God's timing when we pray. Now, let's admit, that's one of the most difficult things that we could ever do because, you know, when we ask God for something and it appears as if nothing is happening, we're going to be talking about that today. But before we get started, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance to learn from a very raw and very real situation with Mary and Martha when we see, Father, that uh, they were in a desperate need and uh, they asked for help. And the help didn't come the way they had anticipated and didn't come in the time that they were hoping, Father. But the one thing we want to gain out of this whole message is this, but you will always come through. So we just pray for that today. If there's someone right now who's struggling with something, they're struggling with, you know, maybe they've prayed to you, they've asked for that answer, but Father, they haven't seen the result. We pray that they know that you're working it out. And as we look behind the scenes today to see that, help us, Father, to move forward with confidence, knowing that you're our Heavenly Father that loves us and are there for us. Father, we pray our Son, Jesus' name, amen. So again, if you want to take out your notes out of your program there, you see that the title for today's message is God's Timing. Now, I realized something about myself, and, uh, and it's something that I have never really quite grown out of. You know, when I was a kid, um, I, I wanted something really badly. And I, don't, I think most of us have been in that situation where when you were a kid, there was something that you really wanted. That, that, that It was the thing that you told your parents. If I got this one thing... I will never ask for anything ever again. See, some of you, your kids just asked you that last week. You know, so, so there's this one thing that if I had this thing, I promise. I remember there's this one thing I told my mom. Mom, if you buy me this, I'll never ask for anything again. I prayed, God, if I got this thing, I will never ask for anything again. I was lying at that time because, of course, I'm going to ask for more. But, but I, I was. I was like, if I had this, this would make me so happy. It was the Atari game console from back in the day. I remember that, that Atari. I wanted that game Pong, you know, the boop, boop, boop. All the young kids are going, what is that? It was, you know, nowadays, you're, yeah, it's boring, yeah. But it's just a little ball that goes, tink. And then you play with a friend with a little knob, and then the thing kind of slid, slid up and down. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. So that there was the game, you know, back in the day. And I wanted it. I'm like, mom, please, please. And she's like, look, we can't afford it. She was a single mom with a bunch of kids, and she was like, I, we just can't afford it. We can't afford it. So I would always go to my friend Travis's house because guess what he had? He had an Atari, yes. And I was like, he's my best friend. He's like, I got to go. It's okay, cool. See you later. I'm going to play with you again. No, but, but so I, would, I, I wanted this Atari. And w- unfortunately, it never came to fruition as a kid. Now, later on in life, as I became an engineer. I was like, hey, I can go buy myself an Atari. But you know what's crazy? They're expensive. Oh, my goodness. They're collector's items now. I'm like, it's still the game. Poop. I mean, I can't believe how much money they want for that stuff. You know, if you have one, save it. You're going to make a lot of money later on on that thing. And, and so here's the thing. Is it, it, I was praying for it. I wanted it. And I got to tell you, for, for a while, I doubted my mom. I would tell her, Mom, if you really love me. I actually told God. I remember I dropped to my knees and said, God, if you're real, you would give me an Atari. And didn't come through and go, well, maybe God's not real. And I realized something about this. That it's kind of funny when we talk about an Atari and stuff. But I realized that even as grownups, there are times when we kind of go through that. That there are times when we're asking God. See, we ask God for stuff all the time. And and we want God to answer it. And it might not be an Atari. It might be something with a little bit more substance today. But we're saying, God, if you exist, God, if you love me, you would give me this. God, if you would help me through this situation. Maybe it's a physical situation. Maybe it's a relational situation. Maybe it's a financial situation. And we're going, God, if you exist, I need you. And isn't it wild how sometimes when we're begging God, it almost feels like nothing is happening? 
it almost feels like God is silent. I want you to know something. God's not ignoring us. If there's anything I want you to grab out of today's message is God loves you. God is working through his plan in your life. And God has big plans. He's going to help you overcome. And so we're going to learn this by looking at the life of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now, if you look at the situation with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, you see that Jesus was very close to them. They were very close friends of his. And so Lazarus ends up getting sick. And when Lazarus got sick, um, I mean, I'm talking about really sick. I'm not talking about, you know, pollen allergies, you know, when you're, you know, you're outside. Like right now, I'm having really bad allergies. I'm feeling kind of lethargic. So I'm not talking about that. Although it can be dangerous if you're driving and you sneeze on the freeway, right? I mean, that can be dangerous. But for the most part, allergies aren't very bad. And so I'm talking about he was really sick. And so Martha says, look, Jesus, uh, Lazarus is sick. Sends a messenger, messenger to him. Now, when the messenger gets to Jesus and says, look, Lazarus is really sick. We don't think he's going to make it. We think he's going to die. It says that Jesus waits two days. He's like, all right, I'll be, I'll be right there. And he waited two more days doing what he was doing in that town, teaching in that town. And so then after that, then he heads on over. Now, in the time that he heads over there, Lazarus dies. And in that moment, I thought about that in that moment, Mary and Martha must have thought, God let us down. I mean, what happened here, Jesus? We've been following you. We put our hope in you, our faith in you. We wanted this thing, and then right now, we've lost. They didn't realize the miracle that was about to happen. See, oftentimes, I believe that we stop before the miracle happens. And Today, we're going we're to show you don't stop before the miracle. Because it looked like Jesus dropped the ball, but I promise you this, he, he did not. And it might look in your life today that Jesus is dropping the ball, but I promise you, he's not. So if you're going through a tough time, I'm going to tell you, pay attention to these five things today. If you're not going through a tough time, if right now your prayer is as much as just wanting a new Atari, I'm telling you, write these principles down because you're going to go through a tough time where you're going to need to go back and reflect on these five things. Because I want you to know something, that God is doing something when, it, when we do pray, when we're asking God for help. So let's look at the five things that God does when we pray, when we're asking him to help us in our life. The first thing is this. It says, Jesus demonstrates unique timing. So let's go ahead and look at the text here in verses four through seven. It says, but when Jesus heard this, heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness is not to end in death but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, the disciples in this moment didn't even know what he was talking about. They're like, oh, okay, he's just sick. He's got pollen allergies. Got it. All right. So, but they didn't realize what he was going to do after this. So then it says here, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, who was really close to them. So when he heard that he was sick, that Lazarus was sick, he then stayed two days longer in a place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now, this surprised me the first time I read this 20 years ago. Because when I read this and I was studying through, through the Gospels, when I first gave my life to God, I was like, okay, I don't get it. It says here that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He was really close to them. And now he gets message, Martha sends a messenger to go tell him that Lazarus is extremely sick. They don't know if he's going to make it. And it appears as if he's not in a rush. It appears like he's going, yeah, I'll get there when I get there. You know, uh, he didn't leave right away. He stayed there. He stayed there two days. Actually, if you go back and you, and you study this, you see that scholars say it was actually four days that, that, that he, that, uh, before he went over and saw Mary and Martha. Because it took one day, so Martha told the messenger, go and tell Jesus. It took the messenger a day's journey to go and reach Jesus. He then tells him the news, says that Jesus stayed there for two days. And then after that, Jesus then had to walk over there. So that's another full day's travel. So it was four days before Jesus was there. That's why, when, that's why later on you're going to see in the text where Martha says, he's been dead for four days already. It's because those days had already passed. See, it was, this was a time where, where Martha wanted Jesus to, to, to be, a, be a teleporter. You know, Jesus, I just want you to go, boom, I'm going to pray, and I want you here. I want you here right now. It, isn't that how we are sometimes when we ask God for a prayer? Like, like God, I, I really want this. I really need this. Have, do I got it yet? What happened? I, I mean, God, I really want you to fix this. God, give me patience. When? Right now. You know, I, I, want, I, what, I want what I want when I want it right now. And I want you to imagine, though, what happened in their heart when Jesus didn't show up right now when they wanted. I want you to imagine what happened in their heart as they sent the messenger to go tell Jesus. The messenger travels there one day. Jesus says, okay, thanks for the info. I'll be there soon. Messenger comes back the second day. And now they're waiting. The messenger is back. And they're going, okay, so did you tell Jesus? Yes, I did. Okay, cool. Is he coming? Yeah, he said he'll be on his way. Okay, an hour goes by. Okay, he should be here soon. 
another hour. But there's nothing in the scripture that says that he told the messenger he'll be there two days. He told the disciples. So another hour stays. Another, another hour goes by. The whole night goes by. Can you imagine what they were going through? A whole another day goes by. And, you, and, and it, the horror, the, you know, how they felt in their heart, the horror that they felt. They're going, where is Jesus? I'm sure that they went through going, Did, does Jesus even care? Why is he not answering our prayer right here, right now? And I believe that that's something that we go through pretty regularly. I can tell you I've gone through that. Where I've prayed and said, okay, God, I, I really need your help. I, I need your help in this situation. But the wild thing is this, is that we say, God, I need your help in this situation. And then we try to put stipulations on the situation. God, I want you to do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. See, and then what we do is then, then we say that this is actually speaking in faith. That, but, that us bossing God around is actually us having faith in God that God's going to come through. Like saying, okay, God, God, I want this how I want it when I want it. That's trust. It's actually not. That, that's, I, and I used to think that. I used to, tell you, I used to put deadlines on God where I would say, God, I trust you, but you got to get it done in this amount of time. You know, if you can get it done by next Wednesday, I know you're God. It, God it, it, you know, I'm going through this financial issue. If you can get that taken care of by the next time I get that pink bill, then I know. And, and so, so we want to put all these stipulations on God, but here's what I realized. Do you know that stipulations and deadlines actually disqualify our trust in God? Think about this. If we say, God, I need you to fix this, and it has to fix within this time, what we're doing is this, is that we're saying that we know more about the timing and the way and the time that it needs to happen rather than the all-knowing, almighty, all-powerful God. See, if what we have to do is, is, is trust in God's timing as well. True trust in God is not just trusting that he will fix it. True trust in God is trusting that he's going to fix it in, his, in the right time. See, God won't always do it the way we want, but he'll always do it the right way. He won't always do it in our timeline, but it'll always be in the time that it needed to happen. That's trust. And that's something that I've had to learn, and I'm still learning. I'm still working through because I'm saying, God, I need that, and I need it right now, and I'm going to be patient. But then the next Monday goes by. Okay, God, I'm going to be patient. And then by Wednesday, I'm going, okay, God, if you can take care of it right now. And God goes, do you trust me? Then trust in my timing. You know, one thing I've realized in my life, and I've seen this in people's lives, is sometimes the biggest mistakes that we make is when we don't trust God's timing. See, because here's what ends up happening, is we, we tend to run, run ahead of God. That when God, we know God is faithful, we know God's going to take care of the situation, but because it doesn't happen in the time that we want it to happen, what ends up taking place is we run ahead of God. Where God says, I want you to be patient. You know, know that I've got you. I've got you covered. It's going to be okay. And all, and, and all of a sudden we're going, okay, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to go in and, and get in this bad investment. Because, because financially, this, I think this is the right thing. And, and instead of waiting for, that, for the opportunity, waiting for wise counsel, we just go and jump on it. And then we go, why am I broke? You know, or, or we jump into a relationship. And we're saying, God, I'm begging you, please be the right person into my life. And God goes, be patient. I, right now, I'm helping you become the right person. So be patient. And after a little while, we go, you know what? Forget the right person. I'll just take this guy. Yeah. I, I, and, and then we go, what happened? See, we run ahead of God. And then we look around and see the mess and go, well, where's God? He's right over there. You ran ahead of him. He told you to be patient and wait for him. Wait for his timing. You know, this here says Jesus demonstrates unique timing. It should have been D Jesus demonstrates perfect timing. That's number one. Number two is this. Jesus offers a bigger life. Jesus offers a bigger life. Now, I love the fact that God is bigger than the situations that we're in. If you're going through a tough time right now, know this, that that. God's bigger than that problem. God's bigger than that issue. And, and listen to what happens here, because Jesus offers something incredible to Martha when Martha is going through this tough time right now. Here's what it says. So, so Jesus waited that time. He waited, waited. He got there four days later. Lazarus is now dead. And here's what it says here in verses 20 through 27. It says, Martha, therefore, when he heard that Jesus was coming, this is on the fourth day, went, uh, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. So Mary was so broken, she couldn't even go out. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here... If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I love this. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. 
Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said the very Christian thing to say, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection on that last day. Isn't that kind of the can thing Christians say? I get it. We're going to heaven. You know? And so, 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 so Jesus says, you know, um, he will rise again. So Jesus goes, yes, yes. I'm trying to give you a, a picture of the big picture, not just this situation. He says, I, uh, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives, who, who lives and believes in me will never die. So he's talking about heaven. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Now, I love this conversation that Jesus has with Martha because he comes up and she runs to him and says, Jesus, if you were here, this would have never happened. Jesus, if you would have done what I wanted, how I wanted it, then everything would have been okay. But Jesus, you know what she just told Jesus? But you kind of dropped the ball on this one. Yeah, that's not a good place to start when you, Jesus walks up, right? <laughs> but, but that's where she went. She said, Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would have never died. You know what's crazy? She was right. She's looking at us going, it would have been so much easier for me, Jesus, if you would have done what I wanted. And Jesus goes, I know. But then you would miss out on the miracle later. See, too often what we do is we, we, we want to have miracle moments in our life, but we don't want the struggle that Jesus will use to show us the miracle. So Jesus goes, oh, we're going to get there. But I want you to know that right now, do you believe in me? He says, I told you. I told you who I was. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And she's like, I know. I believe. I love what she said. She says, even though you weren't here and my brother died, you know what she said there? She said, even then, I believe that you are the son of God and that God answers your prayer. She says, you know what, Jesus? Even though you dropped it, I believe you dropped it, I didn't stop believing in you. Man, I wish that's something we can grab a hold of more today. How oftentimes we believe Jesus dropped it. I promise you this, Jesus never drops the ball. But how we perceive it, he didn't do it how I wanted. He didn't do it when I wanted. So we feel like Jesus dropped the ball. And how many people at that point go, well, I don't even know if I really believe in Jesus. Her response was incredible. She says, Jesus, I believe you dropped it. And even then, I still believe in in you. And Jesus says, yes, you're right. I am. I am the resurrection and the life. You know what he was doing? I love this. He's saying, do you, are you trusting your soul to me? And he's like, do you believe that I am the resurrection and life? She says, yes, I believe. He says, well, if you trust me with your soul, then trust me with this right now. See, I believe that a lot of Christians, what we do is we trust God with our soul, but we don't trust him in our situations. I promise you this that Jesus can handle our situation. That if you trust him with all your eternity, you can trust him with whatever situation you're going through right now. And yes, it feels big. And yes, it feels heavy. I know, I go through stuff all the time. And, and you're going, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this. See, it's okay for you not to know it because God already knows it. See, God knows what he's gonna get you through. See, write those moments down. When you're going through a tough time, please write those moments down because then later on you're gonna go, I've done this where I was in a situation and I seriously, I prayed. Here's my prayer. God, I know that the only way this gets fixed is through a miracle. And then later on, I'm going, huh, that got fixed. And you know what most of us do? Well, that's a coincidence. I'm surprised God doesn't go coincidence. I'm going to zap you right now, coincidence, right here. You know, and, and that's the thing is, is God is always working on our, our behalf. So he's saying, trust me. If you trust me with your soul, trust me right now. Do you believe this, Martha? She says, yes, I do. The same thing is true with us. Listen to what it says here in Ephesians. Write this verse down because it's not in your notes. Ephesians chapter 1, verses um, 18 through 20 says this. It says, I pray that your eyes, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you will open the eyes of your heart so that you can comprehend, okay? So that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints to Christians? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? It says, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, the, at his right hand in the heavenly places. I love this verse because here's what it's saying. He's saying, remember God's power that works for us. Remember his Holy Spirit that comes in us. He says, remember all of that. You know why? Because it is the same one that has the power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same one that raised Lazarus from the dead. It's the same God that works in you. 
So if you trust him with your soul, trust him with your life. Quit relying on your own power and focus on his. That's number two. Number three, if you want to turn over your notes, what Jesus reveals to us is this. Jesus reveals a heart that breaks. So in this conversation with Martha, you know, so Martha runs up to him and says, says, Jesus, if you were here, this would have never happened. Listen to the response here. It says, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, this is now he saw Mary crying, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So Jesus, uh, the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. They, they thought he was crying for Lazarus. They missed it. I, I don't believe that Jesus in this moment was crying for Lazarus. Do you know why? Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Jesus knew he was about to fix the problem. So I don't believe that the reason he was weeping was because uh, of Lazarus. I believe it's what happened there in verse 33. He's, it says there that when he saw her weeping and the Jews that came with her weeping, that it troubled him in spirit that he was heartbroken, that he saw the people that he loves hurting and it broke his heart. I like that about God. I like that God is not this disconnected deity that just is a puppeteer, that is just playing chess and moving pawns around. But I like the fact that we have a God that feels, that hurts when we hurt, that is there, that's compassionate, that is empathetic when, when we're going through, through, through times. And I believe every single one of us feels that way. I know uh, if you're a fixer, which I'm a fixer, uh, a fixer is somebody who just wants to come in and fix the problem. And so there are times when me trying to fix a problem can appear very um, uh, cold. I, I know there are times when I, I, I've come home and my wife's telling me about a situation and she's very upset, sometimes I've been in tears, and I'll come home and I'll, I'll talk to her and she's like, babe, this, here's what's happening, here's the situation. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. This is easy. All you have to do is do, 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 do. First of all, I learned this. Ne when your wife is very upset, don't ever look at her and say, this is easy. You're going to end up on Dateline. Yeah, so, so don't do that. Do not do that, okay? And so, so I'm like, you know, here's all you got to do. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And I can see it in her face because I'm all, I'm happy. I'm all, all proud of myself. I got this. Simple. And she's looking at me like, you don't even get it. And I've had my wife tell me this. I just want you to care. And I'm like, I do care. Just do this and this and this and this. I mean, I'm showing that I care. And then I realized she just wanted me to hold her, tell her it was going to be okay, tell her I hurt with her, that I feel what she's going through. And so that's what I do. I hug her and I hold her, and I'm like, it's going to be okay. Do this, do this, do this, do this. I mean, and, and, because I still can't get out of that mindset, right? And, and, but, th but that's what it is, is we want to be led by someone who actually cares. And this verse right here, I got to tell you, verse 35 I, I believe everybody should memorize that verse. People, I've had people tell me I can't memorize scripture. It's too hard. I can't memorize scripture. You can memorize this one. John eleven thirty five. 35, the middle of that text. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, and I believe it's one of the most powerful ones because it shows us the heart of God who loves his kids. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is this now. So now Jesus is going to step in and work on that situation. It says this. Jesus displays his mighty Power. So we're going to see Jesus display his power. Now, when I was a kid, I used to watch these things, um, these guys that they would go to schools, and they would go and they would rip telephone books. You guys remember those guys? that They would come in, they're, they're all big and buff, and they're like, here, I'm going to rip this telephone book, and they do this, and they start ripping it. And, and I remember just being so encouraged by them. They would take, like, pipes, and they're like, I'm bend the pipes. They would put it on their head and bend it around their head. I'm like, oh, I, I want to do that. I want to do that. I was like, I want to be just like them. I want to have a neck, though, because most of them didn't have a neck. They're just like, hey, yeah, yeah we're going to do this thing, you know. But I actually wanted to still ha have a neck. But I was like, that is awesome. Seeing their display of power made me encouraged. Listen, the display of power that Jesus shows us in, in this text coming up, their power can't even come close. Jesus Christ has the power to fix anything in our life. Jesus Christ has the power to save our soul for all of eternity. Let me show you his demonstration of power here in John chapter 11, verse 39 through 44. It says this. It says, and, and Jesus said, remove the stone. So they're all crying. Jesus sees it, says, come and show me where he's at. He says, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench for he has been dead four days. See, there it is, the four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? 
So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing um, around, I, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had, who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was, uh, was wrapped around with cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now, when I first saw that, I was like, this is crazy. Now, first and foremost, I am so thankful that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Because I got to tell you, if he would have just said, hey, come forth, they were in a cemetery. Imagine all these guys coming up. It's like night of the dead. Like, eh, like ah, ah. Okay, so, so he at least said, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And so Lazarus comes forth. And I, I want you to see something. Because he told her something. He says, I, I told you that what I'm about to do, he says, remove move the stone. And Martha goes, whoa, 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 Jesus, Jesus. I trust you with my soul. I, 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 know, I know that through you there is eternal life. But this part right now is beyond hope. This part right now is already so stinky that there's nothing that you can do about this. And Jesus looks at her and says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you will see the glory of God? He says, the problem isn't my power, Martha. The, power, the problem is this. The question is, do you believe? And I believe sometimes that's true in our life. That, that the issue isn't whether God has the power to help us through that situation, help us through that problem. Jesus is asking us the question, do we believe that he can help us through that problem, through that issue? You see, and, and he actually asked them not just to say, yes, I believe, because it wasn't just a statement of belief, because Martha goes, yes, I believe. But he didn't just go, okay, cool. And Jesus goes, okay, I'm going to move the stone. He actually made them be active in their faith. He said, now, go and move the stone. See, he, didn't see, he could have done it all himself, but he's like, no, I want to see if your faith truly is there. You, know, yeah, you believe that I can save you through this, but let's see if you're willing to take the steps that I'm asking you to take. See, the same thing is true with us. There are times when we believe, God, God, you can fix this problem. God goes, okay. And you're reading through scripture. You're, in, you're doing your Bible time, your prayer time, and you know that God is saying, take this step. And then God's going, do you believe? And you're going, I believe. Are you going to take your step? Well, I don't know if I'm ready to move the stone. And God goes, well, then you're not ready for the miracle. See, sometimes that's what we got to do is we got to get out of our way and say, all right, God, I do believe in you. And whatever stone is in my way, whatever problem is there, whatever, God, you're asking me to take, whatever my next step is, I want to be faithful in it so that I don't miss out on the miracle. And so they moved the stone, and Lazarus came forward. Now, I have to tell you, the first thing I was thinking is, what was their face like? Because Martha thought it was done. Martha was like, okay, move the stone, I mean, she was like, this is already bad. This is not going to work out so well. And imagine Lazarus comes out. Because <laughs> it said that he's still bound up. You gotta know at first, you got to know they were like, ah! Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, okay, this is a little freaky. Uh, oh, it is him. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm trying try to unwrap him. I mean, imagine that situation. But I want you to see that Jesus told them that this whole thing, this whole physical thing that he was about to do, wasn't the biggest purpose of of the miracle. Because if you read in verse 45, it says that when the Jews saw this, that many Jews believed that he was the Son of God, the Christ. They put their faith in him. See, that's what it is. See, too often, we get stuck thinking that the physical thing that we want God to fix is the end result. God goes, that's just a step for you to know that you can trust me. That you could trust me with your soul. That you could trust me that when I tell you that through me there is life, when I tell you that I pay the price on that cross for you, and you don't have to carry the weight of your sin anymore, that you can walk in freedom today, that you can live the life that I intended for you today, and that when it's all said and done, we get to be in heaven for all of eternity together. You can trust me. See, too often we believe that God fixed this physical thing, but think about this. It was temporary. You know that every temporary or every physical thing that God fixes in your life, it's temporary. Same thing with Lazarus. See, Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. He came forth. Lots of people believed. Do you know what eventually happened to Lazarus? He died. So every physical thing that Jesus said, every miracle was, was, was temporary to point us to the eternal. Exactly. So as God works in your life, let it, let it make you focus on the bigger picture. Let it make you focus on what he came to do, not just now, but for all of eternity. And I love what Jesus did next. 
Because the next thing he did is he said, now I want you to be in a community. I want you to be in a family. Listen to what happens here in the last thing. It says, Jesus calls others to help. Now, I love this because Jesus then tries to get other people involved in this miracle. And I love the fact that, that the Bible tells us that, he, that God doesn't want us to do life alone, that God doesn't want us to be island Christians. An island Christian is one that just wants to be by themselves. There are so many times that the reason that we don't take our next step in life is because we're by ourselves and we don't even know what the next step is. But if we can surround ourselves by God's people, surround ourselves by people that are there to encourage us, then we can see what the next step is going to be. And I love this because Jesus, he does this amazing thing. And now think about this. So he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth and he's just standing there. Their jaws are dropped. I mean, they're just there. And then Jesus tells them, I want you to do something. Listen to what it says here in verses 43 and 44. It says this. It says, the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus said to them, he said to the people that loved him, the people that were around him were people that were hurting for him. It was his family. It was his friends, the people that were close to him. He says, you have to understand that, that right now, I want you to be a part of the miracle. Help unbind him. See, he's alive, but he's still restrained. For some of us, that's our Christian walk. Well, we're alive. God has saved us, but we're still walking restrained. And he says, I want you guys to be a part of the miracle. I want you to help unwrap him. Now, why? Because Jesus didn't need them. You know that Jesus could have went, unwrap, boom, all the wrappings could have fell off. You know how I know that? Because he just did a bigger miracle just before that. He said, get up and walk. You're dead. Get up and live. So the wrapping, that would have been easy. But instead, Jesus says, but see, I want to show you that it's not just about what I'm going to do in your life, but it's about what the community. Don't let your life be all about just yourself. There are other people that God brings into your life. There is something to be gained by God's family. There's encouragement. There, there are things that hold us back, and we need those people there to help us, to support us, to encourage us, to keep on going. L last year, I joined a gym at the beginning of the year. I didn't join it. This, I should have stayed with it. But at the beginning of last year, I was like, I'm going to be serious about my fitness. And I was for about six months. All right, so, and, and while I was at this gym, it was a psychosomatic transformation center. And it really did transform me. I've actually transformed back now by 20 pounds. All right, but, but back then, uh, I, I was going to the, the psychosomatic transformation center. And, and, I, and I loved it. Now, I did not love the workouts. I have to be honest with you. I hated the workouts. Hated them. This is why it was so easy for me to go, oh, I got an excuse, I shouldn't go. But, but I, I got to tell you, the workouts, there were times when I felt like I was going to vomit. There were a couple times when I did vomit. I mean, it was bad. I hated the workouts. But the thing that was wild, and I noticed this from the very moment that I signed up, the, mer the very first day, is that whenever you had some progress, they cheered you on. People were excited for you. Like if you're only able to do two burpees, and then later on, you're able to do five burpees. They're like, yeah, way to go. Oh, you know, the, the, the instructor would be like, keep going, keep going. They, they would push you. And whenever you'd finish, people would give you high fives. And I'm like, that is awesome. They're like, look. And, and then there were days where you actually had a day that wasn't a good day. Like maybe you did 10 burpees over here, but you had a bad day. So maybe you only did five burpees. And when you finish the five burpees, you know what they said? It's all right. It's okay. We're here. You get it next time. I'm like, that's what the church is supposed to be like. That when, that we're supposed to be the most encouraging entity in the world. That we're supposed to be a family that is there to help unwrap people who are walking wrapped around by their guilt and their shame and their anger and frustration. And that they're, that they're, that they're just walking around like that. And we should be there to support, to encourage. And when someone stumbles, see, too often, here's what Christians do, is that somebody stumbles. And when they stumble, they go, should have known better. Hey, uh, I know why you stumbled. See, your, your legs, you still have wrapping on them. So, so you got to fix that. You notice Jesus didn't say, hey, Lazarus, unwrap yourself. He says, you go unwrap them. Maybe the reason that person keeps stumbling is not so you can judge them, but it's so that you can help unwrap their legs. So they quit stumbling. Maybe you're the tool that God's going to use to help transform that person's life. See, God wants to use us in community and family. We are part of the miracle. God wants us to be there to support one another. And listen, maybe for some of us, and I've seen this where they're Christians, they've given their life to God for a long time, and, and, and yes, they, they know they're going to go to heaven, but they're still walking around like this with anger, with, with, with you know, resentment, with, with frustration, with guilt. Part of the reason that's, that you're staying that way is because you're not getting connected with God's family. This is why we talk about small groups so much. 
We, listen, small groups aren't about going there and trying to become a Bible scholar and, open, and trying to you know, look at every theological thing in the Bible. A small group is just being around people that will encourage you and will help you to keep unwrapping. Get the things off that are tripping you up in your life. That's what that's about. Because I want you to know something. Jesus Christ wants you to have an incredible life. I've had people say, well, how do we know that? Well, Jesus said it. John 10.10, 10, it says that the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, but I have come to give you life and that you might live it more abundantly. He came to give us an incredible life. I, I, I read a quote about 15, 20 years ago. It was an amazing quote. And this quote said this, that the worst thing in life is not dying. It's living, but never knowing why. So know this, God has a bigger plan and purpose for your life. He really does. Live your life to the fullest. But it all starts with Jesus said there, do you believe? Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that you give us to, to step back and to see a very real and very raw situation with Mar Martha and Mary. Father, they were going through a, such a tough time. I couldn't even imagine all that they went through. Father, they wanted the, the, the prayer answered right then, right there. In that moment, how they wanted, just like all of us, I believe that this, the reason this, this story hits, hits us so much in our, in our heart is because we've all been there. Father, we, we try to put timetables on you, but help us to fully trust you, to not just trust that you will fix the problem, but trust in your timing as well, Father, to know that, that you're gonna do something incredible. Sometimes we, we don't even wanna feel the pain, but Father, but when we're going through the pain, help us to remember that the miracle's coming. And sometimes we have to go through the pain to get to the miracle. We just thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Help us, Father, to pursue you with everything we've got. We praise our son, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, church.